Um, so uh, Jared is uh, finishing up his, or he's pretty much finished his uh, master's degree in MEEPS, and he's also doing a master's degree in education. His, his real love is teaching. Um, he came from uh, El Paso, that's where he's from, um, sort of, because he was actually born in Tupelo in the same hospital that Elvis Presley was born in. So, so, so. <laughs> but he started off at UTAP and they transferred here into our undergraduate program. He got a 4.0 GPA there and then he came into uh, my lab and he did the master's. He would have had a 4.0 in, in a master's degree too, except for uh, Clint McGill. So. It's a warning to everybody else has that. And uh, other interesting things about Jared, other interesting quirks and features of this lad is he's an aspiring animal hoarder. I was just <laughs> attempting to hoist a cat off on him because I'm pretty sure he's soft touch for that. And then he's also uh, completely obsessed with all things Pokemon. And, uh, are you including a Pokemon in your seminar? Not today. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, well, as far as you've been late to mention, my name is Jared Goldman, I'm a med student, and uh, yeah, today I'm going to be talking about scaffolding. It's this technique in education that uh, can promote a lot of different uh, things in education, uh, helps you learning, but today I'm going to be talking about critical thinking in particular. So, um, the objectives for today, I'm going to define what critical thinking is, um, all the different facets of it, and try to uh, condense it into something that's more uh, tangible. And then I'm going to discuss the scaffolding technique. And then the last thing I do is I'm going to attempt to apply this technique to some sort of agricultural education setting. So I guess to start off, the origins of this critical thinking teaching actually starts, it dates back to Socrates. So he established this idea that one cannot depend on those in power uh, to have sound knowledge and insight. And so uh, he, he extended on that by saying it is important to establish the importance of asking deep questions and uh, prob probing into this deep uh, level of thinking to deem ideas worthy. And that's just to establish a sense of independence of the individual and not relying on anybody above you, uh, whether it's uh, economic status or the power level or anything like that. So more modern ideas of critical thinking focus mainly on um, Evaluating information, taking in uh, the question and thinking at, at um, thinking about it on a very deep level. So here's some various definitions that I found on the internet. Uh, some of them are from philosophers, like the last one, and the first couple are from maybe the dictionary.com and things like that. So, but um, yeah, so the first one is the process of actively and skillfully conceptualizing, applying, analyzing, synthesizing, and evaluating information to reach an answer or conclusion. Discipline thinking that is clear, rational, open-minded, and informed by evidence. And appraisal based on careful analytical evaluation. And then this last one is purposeful, self-regulatory judgment, which results in interpretation, analysis, evaluation, and interference, as well as an explanation of the evidential, conceptual, methodological, criteriological, or contextual considerations of in which that judgment is based. So, of course, there's a lot of words, key buzzwords in there, and so I kind of condensed it down to a smaller list of things that are definitely a lot more understandable. So the, the most obvious thing um, that you need to think about when you're thinking about teaching critical thinking is, you know, seeking evidence. So students need to uh, be prepared to, once they get a question, to go out and be able to find the find uh, evidence to support whatever claim they're trying to make. The second is closely examining reasoning and assumptions. So this is pretty self-evident, but you know, you're going to closely examine what are the reasoning you're providing to these questions and uh, making assumptions based on the data that you collected. Analyzing basic concepts, so using the concepts that you learn in the class, no matter what it is, uh, and applying these concepts to uh, solve a particular problem in which you're trying to figure out. Tracing out the implications of what is said and done, um, pretty self-explanatory as well. Um, there's always some creative element to creative thinking. Uh, cre uh, creativity is uh, uh, the basis of all, most of discovery, and so in order to uh, come up with your own ideas, there needs to be some kind of creativity, creative element behind, or some original thought in your uh, assessment. And of course, the last one is reflection. Um, whatever claims you uh, come to make, you need to reflect upon why, why your claim is strong, and why your claim might be better than another claim that may be made. So this is something that uh, a lot of education people use in their, uh, when they uh, develop lesson plans. So this is something known as the taxonomy. I think Vygotsky is the one who created this. Um, so basically you can see that there is like a cascade of different levels 
uh, of, uh, of uh, learning objectives and things like that. And so the lowest that you can see here is knowledge area. These are the easiest things that you develop mastery in. So this is like your basic uh, recall of information, discovery, observation, things like that. And as you progress up the uh, pyramid of this uh, Bloom's taxonomy, uh, these, these skills are harder to master. And so it requires a lot more input, not only from the student, but also from the teacher. And so, of course, as I mentioned, it classifies learning objectives by order of increasing difficulty to master. Lower order skills must be acquired before or simultaneously with higher level skills. So you can integrate higher level skills, the things that you evaluate or creating your own ideas into lower level objectives, but it's very important that you, you have one with or before the other. And of course, mastery requires practice. You can't expect a student to immediately walk in and be able to critically think unless somebody along the line has shown them how to do this. So of course, why, why do we care? Why do we care about these uh, critical thinking skills? Well, it enhances our language and the presentation skills. It improves our expression of ideas. So um, the more in-depth you go into something, the more uh, able you are to express in, uh, the eccentricities of whatever you're talking about. Uh, it improves comprehension. Of course, you're diving deep into something, so you're going to be able to understand it a lot more. Um, it's very important for self-reflection. In order to assess your own uh, knowledge, your own metacognitive uh, capabilities, you need to be able to, to dive into these critical uh, critical areas. And then, of course, the last thing is it's very desirable for nearly all of your careers. All of your careers you're going to have in the future, whether it's uh, something like a, like a waiter up to, you know, President, you're going to have you're going to need some kind of uh, critical thinking skill. And so next, I'm going to transition to how you can actually design lessons and use the scaffolding technique to uh, enhance or uh, promote your uh, critical thinking skills. So scaffolding is this technique that it's, it's kind of uh, based on this idea of the zone of proximal development. So as you can see uh, from this little a neat infographic, we have the current understanding. So the current understanding uh, and uh, can work on this is the level in which a student can they can walk into your class or uh, just based off of whatever lecture content you provide, they can work without your help. The zone of possible development is the area in which a student can learn through your help, so are the help of a more knowledgeable other. Of course, this, this is area of out of reach. Um, and critical thinking more often than not lies in this zone of proximal development or even beyond that for a lot of these students. Um, and so it provides a structure for critical thinking. It involves both the construction and systematic deconstruction of the cognitive support structure. Uh, so you, know, you create the lessons and things you're going to use to teach the critical thinking, but you also deconstruct them as you progress through the semester um, in order to, uh, you know, uh, they call it fading in order to fade out and provide uh, more independence to the student. And then, of course, uh, it helps students uh, complete complex tasks. So there's a, there's a lot of steps involved in doing this process. So the first thing is to become aware of the student's current level of performance. Of course, I'll go into a little more detail after this slide about each of these uh, no, uh, steps. But yeah, in general, you need to know what level your students are at as soon as they walk in. Um, you need to use the knowledge of their current level to establish goals for the class, to establish their learning objectives and what skills they need to reach the level. You're going to need to identify culminating assignments or projects that will demonstrate the goals, so uh, different, different uh, assignments that will help emphasize these critical thoughts and uh, projects that will align with these uh, lesson objectives. And then the last thing, the instructor should actually engage the students in these critical thinking skills and provide feedback, and feedback is uh, very important in this process. So when you assess students' uh, current knowledge, you can use the assessment cycle. So uh, when you assess students in your classroom, there's kind of this, uh, there's a cycle that you should follow when you're um, uh, trying to see what students uh, actually are retaining from your uh, teaching practices. And so normally, uh, you either start with some kind of teaching practice or you start with a measurement. In this case, they started with a teaching practice. So um, there are different ways in which you can do this. One of the ways you can assess these students, at least at the beginning, is through pretest. So the pretest is like before you teach anything, assessing what students know, uh, so you can kind of modify what you need to teach or things you need to emphasize later. Um, formative assessment still assesses uh, a measurement after you teach. So after you've taught something, you can ask some questions, uh, uh, give them homework or something that uh, 
lets you know that they know what you're talking about. You can ask students probing questions to check for understanding in a simple uh, if this happens, what happens next, or any of those types of questions to lead them into a direction that, that you can check for understanding. And of course, you can provide uncoverage. And coverage is just a fancy word for uh, if the students don't have the prerequisites, you can dust the prerequisites off before you can get to what, what you actually want to teach them, which is lying underneath. But the second thing I mentioned, the second step is you know development of your learning objectives. So you need to make sure that each of your learning objectives is measurable. Uh, without it measurable, the student doesn't know how you're going to assess them or what you're doing um, to assess them or how they should be able to display the knowledge and what you're trying to instill. So uh, either a student can master the objective or they fail to master the objective. So when you have a, a, a clearly defined learning goal or learning outcome, um, you can easily assess the student on whether they learned it or not. You can start to keep all of your learning objectives measurable, clear and concise, so the more easy it is to understand, the better it is for your students. And of course, you can ass the assessments should be uh, directly aligned with whatever learning objectives you have. And if they're not, there's some disconnect. So your assessments that you create should directly reflect what you're asking the students to do in your learning objectives. And of course, you can see this little infographic over here, learning outcome, all the way down to your teaching approach. So the next thing after you develop your learning objectives, you should develop your assessment. And it should always be in this, this order, uh, just because you need to align your assessment with your learning goals. If you don't know what your learning goals are, you don't know what will be in your test. So there should be similar questions in these assessments to those seen, seen in class. So you shouldn't have really high order thinking skill questions in your assessments if the student hasn't been uh, given that or shown how to do that in class, or at least assessing whether they know how to do that or not. And the last thing is they should em emphasize the direct acquisition of the thing in your learning objective, as I mentioned before. The fourth and final thing are, is actually implementing the uh, scaffolding techniques. So after you've created your, your learning objectives and after you've created the assessment uh, that you're going to use to test the student's uh, uh, learning, you can uh, use these various scaffolding techniques. So teaching modeling it sounds exactly like what it is. Uh, the teacher is going to walk the students through how to think critically in this case. Um, corrective feedback, so when a student, like if a student is assigned a case study um, and they don't answer quite the way you want them to, you can provide them feedback and it gives them the ability to improve upon that based on the feedback for next time. And then a structural prompting, as I mentioned before, asking the students questions that uh, drive them in the direction you want them to go. Um, chunking. Chunking is breaking down a larger problem into smaller uh, compartmentalized chunks. So if you have an overarching question about a field or something, you divide into microbes, the crop itself, the soil, and something like that. And the last thing is peer scaffolding. So maybe the individual student doesn't have the knowledge to be able to uh, come to the conclusion you want, to, uh, you want them to. Um, maybe their peers, maybe collectively, like the pieces of the puzzle, they could fit together and help each other out to come to uh, come to uh, the conclusion that you might want them to come to. And of course, after all of this uh, that I've mentioned, there are some fatal flaws that you guys should really pay attention to when you're designing a lesson. The very first thing is you shouldn't assume anything. Assuming a student learned a skill previously is something you should never do because um, you don't know, how, know what other teachers um, uh, or other professors have taught in their classes or anything like that, unless you are very vertically aligned. Um, vertical alignment is this way of, you know, every grade level, you know, teachers line, line themselves up and make sure that the previous teacher taught all their prerequisite knowledge and to pass on to the next course. Um, and then of course, with your assessments, your student, your assessments should not uh, differ in the cognitive level or the, the level of the taxonomy that outside of what you instructed. And of course, uh, you should you should always use backwards design. So, no use of backwards design is always bad. So, you're you're uh, when you're designing a course or uh, lecture content, you should always start with the learning objective, then go into your assessment, and then finally go into your activity. Um, and if you do it outside of order, let's say you pick your activities first. Well, then your 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 uh, your lecture is going to be based on the activity rather than what you're you're actually trying to teach the student. And of course, fading. Fading is the important thing in this. Um, when you're scaffolding, you're going to show the students all these things that, that you can do, all the things that um, you can help them do because you're the more knowledgeable other. But it is also 
important to, you know, the, the slow progressive withdrawal from aiding the students in these cognitive abilities. You don't want them to completely rely on you um, because that's what's the point of this. You're trying to teach them to think for themselves. Um, so proper scaffolding should allow students to gain confidence and independence. And of course, it promotes the expansion of the zone of proximal development. As we saw in that infographic I showed you at first, the proximal development zone is rather small. But as as you as the students gain more skills, it grows larger, and so the the proximal development zone uh, for the things that they could potentially learn also grow larger. And of course, this last part I'm going to try to apply it to a a situation. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is the agricultural classroom. So at, at least at a and the agricultural classrooms are pretty diverse. They have all kinds of people from different ethnicities. They have all kinds of people from di different socioeconomic statuses, educational backgrounds, religions, regions of origin, whether you're from the city or the country. Um, and then, of course, the fact that undergraduate critical thinking skills are usually very low, mainly because we don't teach these skills in a lot of high school classrooms. Um, of course, we're trying to work on that but it's just something we haven't quite gotten to yet. It's a little difficult to do. So what does the research say about this? So the instructors from Talib and Irani identified four major areas that they can use to uh, uh, utilize uh, to better improve uh, critical thinking skills in their courses. So of course, you know, very big, big broad, divergent thought project, real world project situations, emphasizing the research that is current and modern. Uh, demanding more and richer writing assignments, so any, uh, any way that students can communicate verbally or orally, and then exposing students to differing viewpoints. You know, the only way you're going to get a full picture of something is if you see differing views uh, that are outside of your own. And so I kind of created this big little situation uh, to talk a little bit about how you can apply this stuff. So a farmer has a field displayed on the right, kind of this is a stock photo of this terrible looking field, but, and it is suffering from heavy losses of his plants, uh, what is likely, what is likely the cause and how might you remedy the situation. So there's just a, a lot of different things that you can provide in this case, you know, you don't really know what it is, and so I guess it's up to the teacher themselves and what information they're going to provide students, whether they're providing soil data or genetics or anything like that, but, uh, so some things that I, I've come up with solving this problem is chunking. So you can, like, uh, as I mentioned before, focus on microbes that might destroy the crop or focus on the soil properties and the nutrients that might have destroyed that crop or cause it to be brittle. Or maybe the genetics in the crop, maybe it's not a suitable for lodging in that particular area. And so the students can look at all these different things and come to a conclusion based on that, uh, the collective aspect of all these smaller issues. Um, in order to solve the bigger uh, problem that was being presented. And then, of course, you can model the way to solve some of the problems. So as an educator, you can be up there and uh, you can walk them through the steps of how you would tackle this kind of problem. Um, you can pair students up, as I mentioned before. You can pair students up and, and uh, have them discuss with certain students. As I mentioned, some students are from the farm. Some students grew up on the farm, so they might have a little, uh, a better ask, uh, a better understanding of the uh, fertilizers or herbicides or genetics of the plant that might be uh, important to answering the question. Also, you could have a student maybe from the city that has a very uh, solid grounding in the biological sciences, uh, just because that's what they are passionate about. You can provide prompting questions to guide the students to hear an answer. Um, you can include that in not only the assignment that you've provided, but also uh, in the class itself as they're talking over what to do. And of course, you know, the most important thing is this gradual removal of your teacher input and a uh, greater emphasis on their thoughts. So you're going to have to step away from them for a little bit before you can get to this, uh, this level of thinking um, in order for them to solve things on their own. So in conclusion, critical thinking skills are not inherent and need to be developed in order to reach a level of mastery. Scaffolding is an effective technique to teach critical thinking skills. Scaffolding takes into account not only current level of knowledge, but also the future understanding that you're trying to reach. And then scaffolding can be applied to many disciplines, but works particularly well with applied sciences. I've heard all my acknowledgement. My committee, Dr. Finlayson, Dr. Smith, and Dr. Hayes. Of course, I have to thank the, the department that uh, helped raise me and make me who I am, the Solo Crop Sciences Department, and of course, my new department that I'm entering later, the, the Department of Teaching, Learning, and Culture. Those are my references. Are there any questions? Do we have time for questions?
question? How long has the scaffolding technique been around? I don't know. So it, it's a fairly modern technique. I would say it's from the century at least. It's not something that's like super, super old. Do you think maybe it's been employed before, but we just didn't play with scaffolding? Yeah, it's very possible. So, um, so in the example that you're using, mm -hmm. you said that you would perhaps do it by chunking, and mm -hmm. then you looked at several different ways. Um, you know, you said you'd either model it or have them work in pairs. Um, you know, for for this particular university or for a class that we would have this kind of thing in, um, you know, which which method you think would work best? Like, think about if they're doing this in like soil science or like. You know, 301. So that's a very, very, have a large lecture yeah, hall. very, very large classroom. So I would say that probably the teacher model would be the easiest, uh, at least at first, to uh, get that initial instruction out, just because you can get everyone all at the same time. You can walk them through uh, up at the front of the lecture hall, um, and then I, I would say transitioning into uh, probably the chunking, maybe pairing them up and seeing what they can do as a group. I was curious what age group you're uh, talking about in the whole presentation. Oh, so the age group, it doesn't really matter. Um, the, this kind of scaffolding, uh, it can be, uh, the, the, the age group is, is uh, important when you're considering what exact activities you're doing. So the, the method of scaffolding can help with any grade level. So let's say you're, you're teaching kindergarten and you're not going to be doing the same thing that you're going to be doing in an undergraduate classroom. You're going to, of course, make it a lot more difficult in content knowledge and depth. Um, and so you can kind of uh, scale up. So you mentioned that there's trouble with promoting critical thinking in high school level or even undergrad level. So in terms of curriculum, what would you, what would you think would be a good, a good yeah. approach to that? Yeah, I would definitely emphasize a lot more project-based learning and case study activities because right now a lot of our high school curriculum and some, a lot of our undergraduate curriculum is mostly lecture-based. You know, teachers are standing at the front and more or less talking to the students, and there's no, uh, there's no uh, way for the students to really develop any kind of critical thought in the audience. Um, I mean, of course, the teacher can assign assignments, but, you know, sometimes these classrooms uh, don't get feedback and uh, things like that. So definitely focusing a lot more on uh, project-based learning. How about, how about a specific class? <coughs> Yeah, so there's actually a class for the undergraduates here that is a capstone course, and it is supposed to do those things, but of course, since, you know, along the way, a lot of the courses do not emphasize the critical thought that goes into something like answering a, a broad-range question about an entire form and how to manage it, once you get to that capstone level course, it's not necessarily, uh, I don't know, you don't have the, the, the ability to, to achieve at the highest level that you could have if you were taught these things. Uh, prior to that. You had a slide where you, you said like the three things not to do. Mm -hmm. um, the, well, the last one was going backwards, mm -hmm. where you, you start off with the activity and then you design essentially your approach around that. Is that, is that maybe why standardized testing is one maybe? Because teachers teach the test, they don't teach the, the material? Uh, so teaching to the test in theory is supposed to work. So you, the, technically the, the state has designed the test to emphasize whatever learning goals they're supposed to have. The problem comes in when teachers, as, as you mentioned, they're emphasizing the activity itself and not necessarily touching on those learning goals. If the, if the teacher actually did what they were supposed to and taught, you know, uh, the lessons based off whatever learning objective that they're supposed to teach, the test wouldn't be hard or difficult. It, or at least it shouldn't be if they're aligned properly. Hmm? How would you approach this method using agriculture extension? Agriculture extension? Um, I don't know, that's a good question. So, most of what I do is uh, focusing on the classroom, but I guess with agricultural extension, it would be um, more communication based. So, a lot of the, you know, like the, like, an agricultural extension agent, correct? So you're talking about how, how to improve their abilities. Yeah, I, I would say it's a similar approach because a lot of what they do is going out there and providing information to 
farmers and people about the best practices. So you could do something very similar. Um, I would say a lot of it's modeling, because I think a lot of what they do right now is they shadow other extension agents and things like that, and so that's a form of modeling. Uh, I read somewhere, I don't remember some of the stuff on my head, um, that uh, one of the problems now is that students tend to lose their focus in class, mainly because they think, okay, I can Google this later, or I can watch a video afterwards in case uh, I have any questions after the lecture, I can find information online. Mm -hmm. So, with this new generation that is more like uh, connected to the internet and more, uh, uh, I guess, more really using technology and all those things, how can you use that to keep them engaged in a lecture? Yeah, so that's actually a big topic right now in a lot of the education based courses. So it's kind of funny because you, you attribute these younger students, these younger generations, with knowing how to use the technology. But in, in, in real like in real life, that all they're able to do is you know use Snapchat, text, things like that, use you know, social media applications. So they don't actually have the the knowledge of how to use these technologies for educational purposes. And so a, a big, there's a big movement in trying to you know uh, introduce a more educational based uh, apps and things like that to these students to help motivate them. So you know, and any chance, any time you're gonna have a student wanting to pull out their phone, they're gonna try to do it. Um, um, yeah, just things like that, like implementing apps, uh, trying to find ways to uh, use the technology in the lecture. Maybe you can do like, I know some people have done the Kahoot things that teachers have used here. You know, you can create a little interactive lectures where students can answer on their phone and things like that. Very cool microscopes you can attach to your phone and take pictures with. So, uh, yeah, just getting them more engaged with their technology and using it for educational purposes rather than some kind of social media influence. I just to piggyback on that, not to shamelessly plug Dr. Lohman's research, but there's one of her past students who did such, I, I would think, an example of that where um, I don't know, she created like a paramaterial map of Texas and she implemented that, uh, Christine did, for her 310 class, morphology class. And the idea being that this app can contain the Texas paramaterial map that the students can, they have their own set of, um, they have their own tablet, right? Mm -hmm. and they. Follow along, if you will. So I mean, I, I do think there are case studies of that in the Thank you.